I was with my couple of my grandkids at the fair yesterday. They about wore me out. <laughs> Wouldn't see everything, you know, the cows, the horses, everything. And they're so little, so everything they couldn't see. Can't see, so you had to put them up on your... I haven't had ibuprofen yet, but I'm thinking about it. <laughs> I think I can feel it right back here right now as I'm getting ready to preach. But, you know, praise God, it was nice they could do all that. And, uh, you, you, know, I, you know, we talk about authority and authority structure and the importance of it. it you know, as we talk about it, I see it everywhere. You know, we were there in, in the craft section and all that, and, and they had some leaders doing 4-H. You know, and just watching them say, come on, kids, we're going this way, and they're, they're going to do something. And they had these couple of leaders, and I, I said, you know, that's, that's it, respecting those that are leading, and, and whether small groups, whether different groups, and that we have a chance to influence there. And I just saw all these different groups all over the place. I saw the people putting the, the goat show together and how the judges were going to come out and how people need to submit. Even if you don't like how the judge judged, the judge is going to judge, and you should be all right, you know. And just saw all those things and, and realize, you know, we've been preaching about it for a while, that, that we all have these places of authority. And it's so important, especially for believers, because believers, it's, it's even beyond anything that is, is the authority structure in the world. Because we are representing something, not just ourselves. We are representing who? God, Jesus. And, and we become a picture of what? Our future. We become a picture of our future. I, we, we have a faith for what? What's in our future. We have a hope of what? What's in our future. And, and who changed me? The God who has invited me to a future. And so we are to be conformed to him. We're to be living like him. We're to be a picture of our future. When Jesus came, what did he say? If you've seen me, you've seen, you might as well say, your future. I've, I've come to represent heaven on earth. The, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we said it was like the son of God it had the glory, the revealing of our future. And then when we come to Christ, what does he then say? Now become like me. Be conformed to how he did it. So what are we becoming like? Our future. And so as we speak uh, today, I'm just going to look at this a little bit differently, but I hope it will help you understand something. How many of you, when you got saved, because I did this, because when I got saved, my pastor wasn't even saved. I got saved outside of my church. So what do you do? Well, I went and grabbed a Bible and started reading in Genesis. Did anybody else do that? You know, what do you do with that Bible when you get saved? You start reading in Genesis, right? That's wonderful. And you get to Exodus, and you got all these wonderful stories about Abraham and all those things, and then Moses and their delivery. You know, they're powerful things to read. Then you get to Leviticus. And, and especially when you're a new believer. I was 13 years old, and I'm trying to figure out why are we killing everything, you know, or... We're, and, and you know, and we've got this way to to live, and it, you know, it, you're you're wondering, all right, how does it all? And you're reading it over and over and over again, and you get in numbers the same thing. And but man, once you get an understanding of what God was trying to do, what He was trying to show, in the same way, when I say that people can see me be, or, or be conformed to be like Jesus. It's a picture of, of the future. What was he doing there when he called out this nation of Israel? Out of you know, all these nations in the world, he says, I'm going to call out a nation to do what? To give the world a picture of the future. They got to have a picture of the future. So Israel's called out and they didn't do a good job. How many of you know we don't do a good job? We keep messing up the picture. But God's trying to give us a picture of the future. So he calls out a special people. He calls them his people. He calls them like, like he is their husband. Oh, isn't that in our future? Aren't we going to have a husband in the future? The believers with Christ? Yeah. And, and, and he made them a special and, and put his tabernacle there, the, the place where they could say God is. And he had the people surround him. And in that tabernacle, his glory would show up and, and, and he had this priestly system to minister to him. 
And you might say, oh, my dear, the rules are, the, it seems so harsh, but yet he constantly was giving us a picture of our future. If we can understand this, we'll understand why we must live as he calls us to, to be a picture of our future, if we can see all this. Well, let's start out here. When Jesus was praying, less than 24 hours before he was going to be on the cross, Jesus is praying here in John chapter 17. Look what he says. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So I gave them your word. And what, what is the word doing? It's changing them. It's pulling them out. If they're following after me, they're being pulled out of the things of the world. And when, when you get pulled out of the things of the world, guess who doesn't like you anymore? The world. The world doesn't like you. This is, this is in general because when we come to the Lord, guess what? He takes us as we were with all of our stuff and how much we are connected with the world. But as we start walking with God, what does he do? He separates us from the world. He, he's moving us toward our future. We don't look like the world anymore. And, and, you know, I've got lots of people in the world that did not like me. I separated from them. I wouldn't do their stuff. They, you know, I... I, I Lost a lot of friends in school. I got saved at 13, and then I'd be invited to go out back, you know, after school to, to drink the whiskey that somebody has stolen from their father's cabinet or something, and I wasn't going with them. So I'm the odd guy out. Everybody else is going to go back there and drink something behind the school. I'm not. I'm not. And then they, they you get invited to say, hey, we're going to go over here with this girl, and stuff's going to happen. And I go, I'm not. I'm not, I, I, I can't go with you, and, and then they might have stories or whatever, but, but I separated myself from the world and what the world did, and, and so after a while, they weren't inviting me to those things anymore. How about that? You know what I'm saying? Because you get separated. You, you start following the Lord. All that stuff gets out of your, your, your life. And so Jesus is saying this. You know, I gave them the word, and the word started separating them, and the world didn't like it. I do not pray that they should be take them out of the world. I don't pray you take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. From the evil one. Because what does the evil one want? He wants you to get back in the world. You know, but, but Lord, help them to not be caught up in his temptations. Help them to understand wisdom and know that you've called them out. So even though he's calling them back, Lord, give them that ability to, to understand. Don't go back. You know, come on out. Keep looking toward your future. And so I, I pray you don't take them out of the world, but they're not of the world, even though we're in it, we're not of it. They are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. So sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So give them this word, let this truth come to them. And with that truth that they understand, they need to separate themselves. See, when we take the word of, of grace and that story, and somehow we make people comfortable in their sin. Well, that, that is such foolishness. That is not the scriptures at all. When the word of God and the truth comes to us, it doesn't make me stay in my sin. It pulls me out of it. I don't want to stay there. I want to look like my future. Listen, when we came to the Lord and we got baptized, we got baptized away from our sins as we died to our past. We're not keeping it anymore. We died to our old life and we come out of that baptism to what? To newness of life. To be able to live another way. What, what way am I starting to live? Like our future. We're starting to look like our future. I'm conforming to Christ. I'm conforming to how he did. When he came, he gave us a, a glimpse of our future. Now I'm the glimpse of the future. How about that, brothers and sisters? The world should see the future in us. They might not like you, but boy, it'll, it'll get them. It'll make them hungry. It'll make them thirsty. You know, I, I've told this story before, but I've, I've had it at least three times, maybe more, but three times when people came up to me to say, I don't know whatever it is you have, but whatever it is, I got to have it. Don't know what you got, but whatever it is, I got. Why? Because they saw such a difference in me. But they were crying out for it. Some of those same people hated me. They didn't see them in me and they hated me for it. But then God got them so hungry and thirsty, they cried out and said, I got to have. Those are the easiest salvations, the easiest blessings, the easiest prayers I ever did. 
when somebody came to me saying, whatever it is you got, I got to have it. How do they do that? Not me looking like the world, I can guarantee you that. I remember watching a testimony of a man, a man who was long-haired, the leather jackets, he was a hell's angels guy, motorcycle rider, and he was all that, and then God got all over him. One, I forget what happened that made him do that. Then suddenly he knew he needed God. He said, he said you know, I didn't go look for anybody that looked like me. That's what he said. I never forgot it. He said, when God came all over me, I wasn't looking for anybody who looked like me. And then he went on to say, there's so many Christians trying to be cool and look like me. He said, I know what took me to look like me. The, the world had me. That's why I did all this stuff to myself. That's why I dressed up in their garb. That's why I did it. And when God got my heart, I wasn't looking for anybody like me. He said, because the world did this to me. I was looking for somebody who had a picture of something else, the future. Man, it's so important for us to know because the devil will try to fool you and say, start looking like your past. Start trying to be cool to these people and all that. We're not called to be in it, to bathe in it, to be a part of it again. We're called to come out of it. Anybody remember James Dobson? James Dobson focused on the family. Wouldn't you say he was a decent, holy, righteous man? Yeah trying to show us righteous living. Well, the president, I forget which one, was it Reagan put him on the council to find out about how bad pornography has become in our nation. Remember that? It was, I forget what they called that committee he was on. He had to resign from the committee. He said, because I was on that committee and I thought this is going to be good that we can find this out, we'll help our nation. He said, but I got to see so much garbage, so much stuff. So much evil. He said it was ruining me. I couldn't even think straight anymore. I was seeing so. I'm not made for that kind of stuff. That's right. He's not made for that kind of stuff. No matter how bad it gets, we're not to be bathing in it. We're not to be doing all that. Remember we talked about the purity of God, how, how God is pure. We used all the scriptures that showed that God is pure. And we tried to explain why Jesus, when, when, it, when the scriptures say, don't, don't go and touch a leper. You know, when it says, you, you know, you don't touch a, touch a leper, you know, it's, and he's supposed to say, unclean, unclean, and, and so you can stay away from him and touch him. But yet Jesus would come and touch a leper. Jesus had no problem touching a leper. Why is that? Because the word says, to the pure, all things are pure. In other words, when you have the purity of God, nobody's going to mess you up. How many of you know God knows all about your sin? How many of you know God sees you when you do it? So he can see all that junk you're doing, all that pornography you're doing. All doesn't mess him up. Come on, to the pure, all things is pure. But that, that garbage that the devil puts you in takes you right down the drain. And he's called you out of that. He, when you know him, he said, now get rid of that old life. Then come to your new life. Come to the new way. And, and that's what we are to be. You know, we're not like Jesus that we can put ourselves in all the garbage and be okay. We've got to be careful what we do because we can be torn up and, and hurt and wounded because we have not been perfected yet. I mean, too perfect. We are being perfected. So we have to be careful and separate ourselves. You understand me, church? All right. So this is Jesus that we are to be like. Back, back up. Did we finish that? We did. Okay. All right. Keep going. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. So you sent me into the world. To be what? To show them the future. To show them heaven. I don't do anything. I don't go anywhere. I don't say anything except you told me, Father, to do it. And if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So he's showing us where we're going, what we're going to be like. And he said, so you sent me into the world, so now I'm sending them. To be what? To be cool? To, to look like the world? No, to be different, to show them something different. You're showing them a new life. You're showing them a new way. You, you know, come on, church, we got to get this in our mind or, or we, we'll get our preaching wrong. Preachers have gone out and said all kinds of things about the love and grace of God in the wrong way because they make us too comfortable in our sin. We're not to be comfortable in our sin. We get rid of our sin. We're, we're not on the practice field of sin anymore. We're on the practice field of righteousness. We got a coach and a manager. It's God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And they're teaching us how to be like our future.
So as you sent me into the word, I've sent them. And for their sakes, I separate myself. See, he's already pure. He didn't need to do that. Jesus could be in any of those places and be fine. But he lived a life that we need to, to follow after, that he was able to separate and show himself he's walking toward the kingdom and, and picturing the future so we could learn from him. He said, so for their sakes, I have separated myself. That they also may be sanctified by the truth so they can learn for themselves that when they get the word, that they pull out of the things of the world and they come into view of the future of the kingdom of God. And they start looking like that and living like that. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who believed in me through their word. Did anybody believe on them through their word here today? I did. That word was passed down through the generations, and I heard the gospel preached, and I accepted it. So Jesus was praying for me that day. Was he praying for anybody out here? Come on, say it. He's praying for me. Say it. He's praying for me. Right there in the word. Praying for me. To be what? To keep looking like the world? No. To learn his word and to be set apart. For another thing. To what? To look like the future. To be a picture of the future. Amen. That Why? That they may be one. All pulled together. Through who? Connected to who? To Jesus. That they may learn how to all be one. You know what's in our future? Oneness is in our future. That they here may learn to be one. How many of you know God hates disunity? He likes us coming together, loving, encouraging, edifying, building up. One That's why we came here today, to celebrate our future and to build up and encourage what? So we go out there and live seven days without falling into sin. So we could go out there and represent God for seven days. Then we come back. We do not forsake the assembling of ourselves. Why? So we can keep being strong to represent what? The picture of the future. So we can hear the word, so we can hear the truth, so we can conform to look like Christ and then go out there and live it for seven days and come back here, do it all over again. Clean ourselves up, take that world off of us and look like our future. Come on, church, are you hearing me? That they may be one as you, Father, are in me, as you and I are one and I in you, that they also may be one in who? Us. Us. That's our future. One with God Himself. That's our future. We don't want to mess that up. We need to be thinking that's our future. So when the devil tempts you to do anything that is dark, anything that does not edify, remember when Paul said it this way if anything's good, if anything's just, if anything's honorable, many things, all these different good things. He says, think on those things. Why? Because that's our future. That's our future. And they may be one in us. Why? That the world may believe that you sent me. That the world will see these people shining that look like their future. And I can believe there is a God. I can believe there is a future. I can get hungry and thirsty because I watch them. And I may fall on my knees one day and say, whatever it is you have, got to have it. That doesn't happen when people are just living the world's life. That's called uh, covetousness. If they're looking at your boat and they want your boat, or they're looking at your car and they want your car, or they're looking at your house and they want your house, or your money and they want your money. But man, when they look at heaven in you and they want that, they got the most valuable thing that you got to give them. Amen. Amen. All right, keep going. Now that we've said that, now we're going to look at Leviticus. Maybe this will help you understand something that eludes us, that makes us look at the Old Testament and go like, what on earth are they doing? When you understand God always wanted us to have a picture. God pulled out a nation so we could have a picture. God created a priesthood with a place, a tabernacle, a temple, so we could have a picture of our future. Watch this. 
came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel and said to Aaron, Take for yourself a young bull as a sin offering and a ram as a burnt offering without blemish. What are this bull and ram going to represent? Christ. That's right, Jesus. Jesus is that perfect one. He's that pure one who was sacrificed on a cross for our sins. So this offering is representing Jesus. All those offerings, every offering they did was a representation of Jesus. So this is representing Jesus without blemish and offer them before the Lord. And to the children of Israel you shall speak, saying, Take a kid of the goats as a sin offering, representing the Lord, and a calf and a lamb, both of the first year, without blemish, representing the Lord, as a burnt offering, also a bull and a ram as peace offerings. Remember it says that Jesus made peace. He went to the cross and made peace between us and God. So here we go. To sacrifice before the Lord and a grain offering mixed with oil. Now, why did Aaron sacrifice for his own family and then instruct Israel to bring a sacrifice for each one of their families, everybody? So you can imagine, there's a lot of dead animals laying around. All the families of Israel had to do it. Aaron did it for his family. So, you know, there's a million people there, but, but each one representing a portion of their family. So however that divided up, but they all brought a sacrifice. Why? Why is God asking for this? Look, for today the Lord will appear to you. Wow. So he separated this people out there. He's called them to himself. Talks about being their husband. And this is, and he says, now I want to show you who I am. So what is he going to show them? Their future. I want to show you who I am. So you got to do all this sacrifice, which represents the, the, the son, and with sins paid for, you get a glimpse of your future. Okay? So they did all this. Look what happens. Keep going. Uh, down to verse 22. Then, Because they did all the sacrifices. Then Aaron lifted his hand toward the people, blessed them, and came down from offering the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the peace offering. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle meeting and came out and blessed the people. So they, they went in there close to God, and they came out and blessed the people. So here we go. Then, so all that sacrifice was done. So what Jesus did on the cross has been represented now. And then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And to see glory is to see something of God. You don't have glory without God revealing something. So somehow, it doesn't describe how, but somehow God revealed himself to the people. So here, here they are in front of that tabernacle, and God somehow reveals himself. We're not told how, they, but somehow God revealed himself. They saw the glory of the Lord, and they couldn't see it without sins being paid. Come on, do you understand? And fire came out from before the Lord. Remember, God is a fire. So he reveals himself in glory, and all the people saw. Everybody saw it. Nobody missed out on this one. And then fire came out from him and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on, on the altar. Imagine everybody had done their sacrifices, everything, and God came out and consumed everything that was sacrificed. Everything. I'm telling you, this was a fireworks show. This was a 4th of July like we've never seen. And, and poured it out, burned up all the offerings, and what did that do? When the people who were looking at the glory and then fire came out, burned up everything they'd given to the Lord. Here's what happened. And when all the people saw it, because they all saw the glory, now they all saw the fire come out, and they shouted and fell on their faces. They said, oh, my, now I've never seen anything like this. And they got on the ground. Now what happened next? Here we have it right here. Chapter 10, verse 1. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer, put fire in it, put incense on it, and they ran out before what? Before that glory of the Lord. Here is the glory of the Lord. Here is 
our ability to, to get to know our future because sins have been paid. And then they say, all right, let me go out here and walk out in front of the glory of the Lord. And I'm going to take an offering. I guess they thought that that was so cool. The fire coming out, that was so cool that they're going to do another offering. Maybe they'll get to see another light show. So they decided they're going to walk out. Here's the problem. And they offered profane fire before the Lord. Why was their offering profane? It was just like any time they did an offering before. Why was this profane? And it says, they brought profane fire before the Lord, which he, the Lord, had not commanded them. Meaning, so here is God showing your future, showing the presence of who he is, and that's when you decide to do something he didn't tell you to do. He's showing you in full power who he is, and that's when you decide to be your own boss. Remember when the Holy Spirit was moving so powerfully in Jerusalem that people could just have the shadow of Peter touch them and somebody got healed? That's pretty powerful, wouldn't you say? It says they were turning Jerusalem upside down, and they used words like they used for Jesus that said everybody was being healed. And it was at that time that Ananias and Sapphira decided to tell a lie. And what happened when they told a lie within the midst of that much power? They both died. Yeah, that's a foolish time when God's moving so big to start telling lies. That's a foolish time. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them. And they died before the Lord in the presence of His glory. They died. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, and Moses is talking to the father, all right, of Nadab and Abihu. This is talking to their father. By those who come near me, anybody want to come near him? Nobody. Anybody want to come near the Lord? Two of you. I said, I I'm ashamed of crossroad right now. <laughs> Nobody wants to get near the Lord in this house. Does anybody want to get near the Lord? Yes. We didn't come here to not get near to the Lord, right? We came here to get near to him. We are Together in this, God can be here. So this is why we came. Listen to what he says. If anybody wants to come near me, I must be regarded as holy. Did you hear that, church? I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified as what how to glorify is to reveal something i must be glorified before all the people as what as holy so mom and dad when you teach your kids you teach them that god is holy you teach them there's a reason we don't lie there's a reason we don't steal there's a reason we keep ourselves for the one we're going to marry because god is holy and we're trying to be like him. Come on, church, do you understand? And he said this to Aaron, who just lost his sons. He says, listen, if you're going to come near to God, you've got to come with a mindset that he's holy. How many of you just brought into the sanctuary all your junk? <laughs> you know, you, Pastor, you talk about having a great seven days. I had a pretty bad seven days. And I brought the garbage all in here with me. Listen, I bet you we could tell a lie here and nobody die. Right? Why? Because I think sometimes we bring so much of the world in here with us. How's the holy God going to show himself in this room if we've got so much of the world in here with us? We got to trust in Jesus and we got to do a different life. We got to come in that he is holy and I'm telling you, be ye holy, for I am holy. When we do holy, he will show up and we'll see. I'm telling you, everybody in this prayer line is going to get healed. There's going to be such power of God when he is holy in our minds, when he's holy in our hearts, when he's holy in our actions. But many of us, we've been kind of living all seven days how we wanted to. Now, religiously, we showed up back here, but 
We could shock our brothers and sisters if they knew what we did the past seven days. Is it any wonder then? We have miracles. But would Jesus have to say this? I can only do so much at Crossroad because they bring so much of the world into holy. Holy would like to show up, but I can't do much. Remember when Holy showed up to Nazareth? And it says Jesus could do no mighty works there because he wasn't holy with them. Right? They said, uh, you know, he's got all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, but he could do no mighty miracles because they just would not believe, which meant they wouldn't walk with him as holy. So, back up, back up, back up, back up, back up, back <laughs> up. So Aaron held his peace. His sons just died, but he is the high priest. Here's what I need you to see. This is where we start seeing it. Aaron has been anointed as the high priest. He is a picture of the future. It's tough on us to try to be a picture of the future because we're not a good picture. We ruin the pictures all the time. But God's trying to give us a picture. Aaron is the high priest. So they came and took the bodies of Nadab and Abihu, but Aaron was not allowed to go to the funeral. What? Well, God seems mean. He's not letting Aaron go to the funeral. Yeah, and he wasn't allowed to pull his hat down, put ashes on his head. He wasn't allowed to rent his clothes. Well, that's what everybody does. They take their hats off and they rent their clothes and they show how sorrowful they are and they mourn for 30 days. Aaron wasn't allowed to mourn for one moment. And you say, Pastor, why did God do that to Aaron? He didn't do that to Aaron. Aaron has been chosen to be a picture of what? The future. Guess what's in our future? There is no sorrow. There is no mourning. There is no death. There is no loss. Come on, church. Therefore, if Aaron is a picture in the Old Testament of our future, he cannot mourn. Because there is no death in the future. There is no sorrow. You got a heartache you think you can't get rid of, well, just wait till you get to heaven. It ain't going to be there. It's going to be gone. And he represents that future. So he wasn't allowed to do that. Now keep going. Verse Down to verse 8. Then the Lord spoke to Aaron saying, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink, you nor your sons with you. When you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. Now Aaron held his peace, and I think Aaron held his peace because he knew exactly what happened. I think most all the people knew what happened. The fireworks show happened. He burned up all the offerings. The people shouted and went to the ground because they say, Oh my dear, what on earth did we just behold? They all went to the ground except Nadab and Abihu. What's wrong with Nadab and Abihu? Why is it they're suddenly saying, man, that was, that was some kind of light show. I'd like to see more. Let's quick, let's get an offering. We're priests. Let's get an offering. Let's put it in here. We're going to go out here. And we're going to see if we can't get some more fireworks. They have no sense about what just happened. Everybody else is on the ground. Everybody else is falling on their face. Yet you can hear. I'm sure people were on the ground saying, who is that walking around out there? Who is that stumbling and mumbling and making noise and the... They probably glance up and they go, look at that. There's Nadab and Abihu and they're walking right into the presence of the glory. And then they all saw more fire come out. Only this time it was killing Nadab and Abihu. What's wrong with Nadab and Abihu? I think before the glory showed up, they'd been drinking. They were intoxicated. They were priests of the tabernacle. They were pictures of our future. And yet what are they doing right now? They're ruining that picture. They were drunk and had no more sense. Everybody else fell on the ground. They were drunk. They had no more sense of saying, that was cool. Let's see some more. I'm going to take another offering right out there. And let's see, let's see it again. And God burns them, up, burns them up. And then he says, now, we're going to add another law to you, Aaron, because of what you just did, what just happened, what everybody just saw. And it says, you, Aaron, your family, as priest for me, you will not drink wine or intoxicating drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go to the tabernacle meeting, lest you die. 
It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. Why? That you may distinguish between holy and unholy. How many of you know when we start drinking, we start not distinguishing holy and unholy very well? And unclean and clean. How many of you know when we're drinking, sometimes we don't all, our, our lips get a little loose. We've got words coming out we wouldn't normally say. We live a life we wouldn't normally do. How many times have I had people in trouble and they say, well, we started drinking. Then it happened. The accident or the pregnancy or the... Don't we understand? You cannot be able to know holy and unholy if you do it the world's way. It's so foolish when I hear believers who've been believers for a while and then they suddenly think it's cool and social to start drinking and to start doing it. Have you heard the ministries that have fallen recently? We've had multiple ministries fall. If you go back to the history, they started out with social drinking. They started allowing themselves to socially drink with everybody else. And they said, it's okay, there's grace. Oh, there's grace. They should have talked about holy. Grace takes me to holy. It doesn't take me to sin. And they said, it's, it's okay. We can socially drink. Some of you out there right now, you think, hey, that's, it's okay. It's all right. But I'm telling you, nobody comes to the Lord to drink more. We come to the Lord and we got to drink less. Why? Because we've got to be able to distinguish between holy and unholy. And, and, and they start drinking and then suddenly... Uh, other stuff starts happening. And then you hear that same pastor that allowed himself to socially drink now had an affair with somebody. And then, then they do something else. And then they start messing with the money. And next thing you know, the whole ministry's gone. And where did it start when they couldn't separate holy from unholy? And they allowed themselves to start doing what the priest could not do. Why? Because they were a picture of the future. And if I don't want to mess up the future, it's good for Pastor Rick to stay away from drinking and alcohol. Amen. That's right. Oh, some of you don't think so, but it's really good for Pastor Rick to stay away. I don't, I don't even want to see me with alcohol. I, I have no clue what I'll do, but I'm sure because I've stayed away from it forever. You know, I, I had people come up and say, I, you're a liar because I said, I, I don't, I don't, I've never had a beer. I've never had any of that stuff. I, I, thank God I got saved at 13 because I got invited to go have the whiskey and, and all that, but I was saved by that point, so I didn't do it. People can't believe I've never taken a drag on a cigarette or, or anything like that. They say, really? Are you really? Yeah, yeah, because I got saved. I could look at people, my grandfather, hacking after a meal. And I'm saying, why do, why do I want to be like that? I saw the town drunk stop me on my bike to ask for a quarter so he could go get a drink. And I'm saying, why do I want to become that? To separate holy from unholy. And it stayed here in my life. I thank God for it. But it's not to be braggadocious or to say prideful about it. It's just our future, and I want to stay in my future. I don't want to drop back to the past. I don't want to be a part of that. So he says you can't have that. And that you may, keep going, that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. So you can become what? A teacher of the future. You can show your kids the future. You can show them why they're doing it. And let me tell you, it's much more inspiring to our children to know about their God and that's why we don't do certain things and not simply have a rule like, don't do that. Don't just tell me, don't do that. Tell me why I'm not doing it. It's because God's given us a future and we, we've been called to look like it. Did you get saved, my son? Then start living like Jesus. You know, all right, keep going. 21 verse 10, he who is the high priest among his brethren on whose head the anointing oil was poured and who is consecrated to wear the garments. So now there's no better picture of our future than the high priest. Jesus is our high priest in the future, right? Here's, our, here's the high priest and here is the most vivid picture of the future. He's the one that lives there in the, in the tabernacle who has the anointing oil was poured on his head, who's been consecrated to wear the garments, he shall not uncover his head nor tear his clothes. Why isn't in the tabernacle that represents our future where we're going to live with God, isn't he going to take off his, his, the hat and rent his clothes? Because there is no mourning, sorrow, or death in our future. It is not there. Nor shall he go near any dead body, nor defile himself, even for his father and his mother. 
Even if his mother and father die, he can't go and do the regular mourning. Why? Because there is no death in the future. He is the high priest. He is in the tabernacle. He's always a picture of the future. Therefore, he can't be like everybody else. This is a picture on the earth that they could see of their future. Nor shall he go in, near any dead body, nor defile himself for his mother or his father, nor shall he go out of the sanctuary, because he didn't go off the property of the sanctuary. He was there to be in the property of the sanctuary. He wasn't to go anywhere else. He lived on that property, and that was his house. If he was the high priest, he didn't get to go anywhere else. Why? Because in our future, we don't leave the Father's house either. Come on, church. In our future, we don't leave the Father's house either. Nor profane the sanctuary of his God. So, I live in this house. I'm not going to profane the house. I live here in this house. For the consecration of the anointing oil of his God is upon him, and I am the Lord. Oh, wow. Let me just say this. When Jesus was at the Lord's Supper, and he goes over uh, the valley, Kidron, to get to the Garden of Gethsemane, when he's crossing over that, and he's telling them, I'm not always going to, I'm, I'm going to be leaving. And they start mourning and all that. And he says the famous chapter of John chapter 14, where he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, right? Well, they are on the other side of Kidron. They can now see the temple. Now, see, we don't have good pictures of the temple because they rarely ever show this. But if you looked at the temple, here's what you would have seen. You would have seen the building as it, as it was built, like you typically see in, in drawings of, of the temple. But on three sides of the walls, the, both sides and the back, there's three stories of levels of rooms that the priests stayed in. There's stair steps that get to each place. If you read your history of the Bible, you'll hear about the stair steps and different things that happened there. We don't show pictures of it. We show a temple of its design, but we don't show the buildings on the outside of the three levels of houses. But they were there. And when Jesus was crossing over and they could see the temple, I'm sure he pointed back to the temple. And he said, in my father's house are many mansions, and the word is not mansions, it's rooms. So he's pointing at the temple with all of its rooms that who goes there? The priests. And who are we? The priest of God. He, so he's pointing to our future. And he says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. How is he going to prepare the place? He's going to go to the cross. He's going to be resurrected. He's going to go to the Father, make all things ready for us. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare that place, I'm going to come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, you shall be also. Where is that? In the house of the Lord. For how long? Forever. So the high priest is that picture of our future. All right? So he's... <laughs> wow. Okay. And he shall take a wife in her virginity. Why? Because that's our future. God's not looking for an unfaithful wife. He's looking for a faithful wife. We are going to be presented to God. The believers are going to be presented to our Lord in a dress of white. That's called the righteous works of the saints. We will have done and honored and loved our Lord. We will have acted like our future. And when he sees us, he's going to say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. He will not say, Oh, you messed up, no longer a virgin person. You will have been honorable to your Lord. You will have been faithful to him. You will look like your future. You will be brought to him. So the high priest then cannot marry anybody except the virgin. Not a widow or a divorced woman or a defiled woman or a harlot. These he shall not marry. Is it because God doesn't love a widow? God doesn't love a divorced woman? God doesn't love the harlot, uh, you know, or the defiled woman? No, he loves all of them. But they don't make the picture. You know why it says God hates divorce? Not because he hates the people. He hates that you would mess up the picture. See, when Christ joins his bride, nobody it's, it's forever. 
There is no separation. There is no divorce. So God wants to have a, a perfect picture. So well, he still loves us. If we get a divorce, yes, he loves us. We've got people here today serving, loving, and, and on staff and, and helping us pastor and all that that have suffered those things. So God loves them and all that. But when you're given a picture, he didn't want the high priest to mess up the picture and he would love us to not mess up the picture either. So when we divorce, he hates divorce because somebody smudged the picture. Of what? Of the future. When my kids look at me, I want them to see a picture of the future. Why do you, why do you love my mom? Because I'm being like our future. Jesus loves me and he's never going to leave me. He's never to, And I do the same with your mama. And she does the same with me. That's what your mom and dad are doing right now. They're loving each other because it's a picture of the future. Because Jesus is always going to be with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. We will never, never be divorced from him. It's going to be forever. And that's the picture. It doesn't mean God doesn't love us if we've messed up. But he wants a picture. Come on, church. Are you hearing me? I'm not trying to beat anybody up. I'm trying to get us to understand that God has always done this. He's always wanted us to have a picture. He's always trying to show us our future. These he shall not marry, but he shall take a virgin of his own people as wife. His own people. We're not going to marry people that aren't like us. We're not going to be unequally yoked. Do you think Jesus is going to be unequally yoked? No, he's going to marry somebody like him. And the Bible says when we see him, we will be like him. We will be his people. And he'll be able to marry us because we are the same. Okay. So the high priest could not be unequally yoked. Nor shall he profane his posterity among his people. He's not going to ruin things down the line because he messed up. He's not going to ruin it. For I, the Lord sanctify him. I, the Lord, separate him. To do what? To look like the future. So as we are now his representatives, as we are his ambassadors of what? Of the future. What is he doing to us? He's sanctifying us also. Why don't we enjoy our sanctification instead of not liking it? Why don't we enjoy the fact that we can't do everything everybody else is doing? Why don't you start stop mourning about it and start celebrating it? and being glad that God allowed you to be a representation of the future to your community, to your neighborhood, to, to the people where you work. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron saying, no man of your descendants in succeeding generations who has a defect may approach to offer the bread of his God. Has a defect means something wrong in his body. Something visible, tangible that you can see that's wrong with his body. Don't let him bring in the offering. Don't let him do the offering in the sanctuary. Verse 18. For any man who has a defect shall not approach a man blind or lame or who is marred in the face or any limb that's too long. So <laughs> one leg longer than the other. You can't do it there. A man who has a broken foot or a broken hand. Anybody ever had a broken bone? I've had them. Anybody out there ever had a broken bone? Well, if you had a broken bone, you couldn't do this. Now, why is he saying this? Now, the high priest and the priest are what? A picture of the future. So guess what's not in your future? A broken bone? A short limb? A birth defect? None of that's in our future. When we get to the end, none of that's going to be there. Praise God. Or a hunchback, or a dwarf, or a man who has a defect in his eye, or eczema, or scab, or is a eunuch. All these things that, that mess with the body. There we're going to be perfect. Every disease is going to be gone, you know. You know, last week, I think it was last week I talked to you about the lady I went to see. And they, they told her she had maybe maybe two weeks. She, I don't think she made two weeks. And I went to see her, and I spoke with her. And I only got to be with her for about 20, 25, about 25 minutes. Because as soon as I got there, the, the hospice lady came to give her a bath. So I, I told her, can you wait in the living room while I talk to her? 25 minutes of celebration. 
25 minutes of talking about her future. 25 minutes of saying where she's going and what, what God has for her. Just celebrated in it. And I'm telling you, I just saw her countenance with joy. I never had so much fun with somebody, ever. I, I, I really, in 21 years of this ministry, I love that moment with her. And when we got done, she, she in her weakness, started pushing herself out. I said, no. I said, she said, no, I want to get up because I want to give you a hug. And she gave me that hug as we celebrated her future. It's so awesome to have a picture of the future. It's so awesome to be a part of it and to live it and to go take it to people and show them that. Lord willing, I'll be able to do her funeral this coming week. And I'm going to celebrate in it. I'm probably going to tear up. And About what? About able to share and be a light to people about our future. Not bring them the world. Not show them a Christian that can't live what they say because they're too full of the things of the world. Just to be able to celebrate in it. No man of the descendants of Aaron, the priest who has a defect, shall come near to offer the offerings made by fire to the Lord. Why? Because he has a defect. He loves them. He doesn't hate them. But once again, if you let them do it, the picture disappears. Because the picture of our future has none of those things. No scabs. No wounds. Can you imagine your flesh perfect? No moles. No... No, no bruises that stay forever. Just beautiful people that you're happy with yourself. You're happy with how God made you. And those of us that are born and things aren't perfect, just hang on. You get there, it's going to be perfect. There will be no people with one leg longer than the other. There will be no deformities. You have scars or mars, they're all going to be healed. We're going to see you as your best self in heaven. That's our future. For he has a defect. He shall not come near to, the, to offer the bread of his God. Now he may eat of the bread of his God, both the most holy and, and the holy. In other words, there's provision made for the Levites. They get to be a part of this. The priestly system gets to eat of the offerings. And he says, listen, all these people partake. They're, they've been called out for that. But when we do the picture, they just can't be the ones to do the picture because it ruins the picture. Now you're still going to be blessed. We're going to take care of you and all that. But if you've got a defect like that, you cannot be part of that. I'm sure people had broken bones, and while they had broken bones, they couldn't do any of the ministry. When they got healed, they could go do the ministry again because they were now representing the perfect. Only, they can eat and still be blessed with all the provision, but only they shall not go near the veil or approach the altar. Why? Because he has a defect. Lest he profane my sanctuaries or ruin the picture. Lest he ruins the picture of the future. For I, the Lord, what? sanctified them. I separated them to look different, to look like the picture of the future. Keep going. Now we hit Revelations. Now we're going to see talk about our future. Look what it says. Revelation 21, verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first er heaven and the first earth have passed away. How about that? You know what's here in our world? Hurricanes, tornadoes, droughts, famines. All kinds of issues and problems. Hot, cold, everything you can think of won't be there. Won't be there. Also, there's no more sea. Sorry, sailors. You might as well start selling your boat now. It's not going to be there. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared, oh, what? As a bride. The holy city looks like a bride. Well, we've been told we're the bride. We've been told that we're going to marry our Lord. So who is this holy city? This streets of gold? This gates of pearl? These walls of jewels and jasper and sapphires and emeralds and rubies? Who is this holy city? It's us. 
The Bible says the 12 foundations had the name of the apostles, meaning the New Testament believers. The, it says the gates had the names of the tribes, which were who? The believers of the tribes of Israel. It's just all the believers. The angel measured it, and it was 12, 12,000, which is 144,000. Don't be confused about that. It's simply a picture. It's a number of the believers. It's a picture of that. It was believers in chapter 7 when they said 144,000. It was believers in chapter 14 when they said 144,000. It was believers in chapter 21 when they show 144,000. It always has been about us and God. The holy city is us. Sorry if I ruined your streets of gold picture. It's God saying how beautiful. You ever, you ever looked at, you know, well, I'm saying it as a guy, looked at your wife and, and man, if people could hear your, your description of saying how beautiful they are to you, they'd say, what are you, what are you looking at? <laughs> but to us, they are so beautiful. Well, to God, we are a beautiful, holy city of diamonds, pearls, streets of gold. That's, that's us to him. Okay? And this city is prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. So God and man coming together, the holy city and God together. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Why? Because there's no tears in heaven. No sorrow in heaven. You think you can't get over something? Well, wait, you'll get there. You'll, you'll be over it. That sorrow will be gone. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. So that high priest in the Old Testament was representing that future picture. And now we get to see that where we are going is that future picture. And we are representing it now. We're not, not waiting there. We're going to represent it now on the way to there. Yeah, go, go back. Did we finish all that? Okay. And there shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. How about that? Anybody looking for no more pain? You know what that means? No more ibuprofen. Hallelujah. <laughs> No more ibuprofen. Keep going. All right. Revelation 21, verse 1. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Glad for that. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all. Come on. All things. You join him, you follow him, you're going to inherit all things. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought the Bible says Jesus inherited all things. Remember at the Lord's Supper it says, having known that God has now put everything into his hands, knowing he's come from God and go going back to God, he put on a servant's towel. Knowing who he was, he could be one of us. Knowing who he was, he could serve us as the lowest person in the room. The Lord Jesus Christ has no problem being the servant in the house. Wow. That's our future. We're going to talk about that in some upcoming messages. And because he inherits all things and we are his bride, we get married to him and then we get all things. Not because we deserve all things. Because he got all things, and then he received us as his wife, and the two became one, and what he has, we now have. He has a throne, we get a throne. He has a scepter, we get a scepter. He has a horse, we get a horse. Of course. <laughs> and, it, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. And here it comes. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And I, we've talked about that before. 
God's fire of his presence is hell to unbelievers. God's fire of his presence is peace to believers. He didn't have to create hell. Life is hell for those who will not believe God. And so, back up, back up. So we have all those things that that are not to be there. Remember when Paul said this, know ye, know ye not. Don't you know that you are the temple of the living God? You're the temple. All of us today, we're the temple. Now, if I know and I really understand we are the temple, what is it we don't do? He says, and do you not know if you join yourself with the harlot, you become one with them? He's, and he's asking the question, if you know you're the temple, if you know that's your future, why are you joining with a harlot? See, if we understand our future and we're living like our future, it'll help us not do our sin. Paul says, obviously, you must not know you're the temple. You must not have this picture of the future if you're willing to go out there with a prostitute, if you're willing to go out there and keep doing your pornography you're willing to go out there and still backbite and stab your brothers and sisters and talk about them and, and be like you are. See, if we know we are the temple, it changes our future, how we live. We need to know we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We need to know we are a picture of our future. If we are a picture of our future, like the high priest could not do these things, we would learn that we can't do them either. And I'm telling you, righteousness would start showing up here more powerful. And the more powerful we are in righteousness, the more the God of righteousness is going to show up right here. The more powerful we become because we are looking like our future. Keep going. Verse 9, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me and said, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to the great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem. So there we are again. He's going to show him the bride of Christ. It's the holy city, which is all the believers descending out of heaven from God having the glory of God. How about that? Remember, God showed his glory to those people there in, in, in the wilderness there with Israel. And now we are showing the glory of God. We have within us the ability to show something that reveals God, coming right out of us. And her light was like most precious stone, like jasper stone, clear as crystal. Keep going. But I saw no temple in it. This is verse 22. I saw no temple in it, the city. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So there is no building there. We don't see a temple because we are the temple. And God is its temple and we are joined with Him. And the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine. For the glory of the Lord illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall never, shall not be shut at all by day, for there's no more night there. Woo, no more sleepless nights. All those grandkids wake me up way too early. I'm, I'm, I'm tired right now, but I'm not going to have to worry about it there. I won't have to be tired there. I'm going to be refreshed all the time. I'll tell you what, my grandkids wake up from a sleep and they, they are just, they're perfect. They're just energy. They got life in them. But by the time they're getting tired, they're messing up. They're being disobedient, all kinds of stuff. That tire is not going to be there. We're going to be energetic. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, but there shall by no means enter into it that that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So our future does not have any of those things. So why would we allow them in our life now? I am called to live by the power of the Holy Spirit and to be a picture of our future. I'm looking at all my brothers and sisters right now. And we are called to be a picture of our future. We're to take it to our streets. We're to take it to our communities. We're to take it to our public buildings. We're to take it everywhere to be a picture of our future. Keep going. Verse uh, 1 of 22, And he showed me a pure 
river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its streets and on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse. He's talking about all that stuff, and he says the curse is gone. The curse came in at the garden, and the curse is going to be gone in our future. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. Because, you know, when the bride marries the groom, she takes the name of the groom. Right? So that's why we have his name now. And there shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. We never leave the city. We're always in his presence, just like the high priest could never leave the sanctuary. All right, keep going. Uh, verse 12, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. That's our future. Let's live like that's our future. Let's look like that's our future. Let's be a part of our future. Let's not talk like we live in the past. Let's live in our future right here, right now. Keep going. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I know some people wouldn't like any dogs there, but it's not talking about that. There's... Who knows? I know we got horses in heaven. We probably have dogs and cats and everything else. What is he talking about there, dogs? He's talking about people who go to the extreme of defilement. People who go to the extreme of defilement will not be there because we can do it all kinds of ways. It's amazing how we can seemingly invent new ways to go to the extreme. And sorcerers, sexually immoral, you know, people debating in the church whether we should do things that are already listed and understood as sexually immoral. Listen, if we know who God is and we're trying to be like our future, there'll be no question of how we should live. We wouldn't excuse ourselves on all these things. It's just we would live like our future, and our future is not that. And whoever loves or practices a lie. Remember when Jesus talked about Judgment Day himself, he, you know, the, he said people came up and said, oh, we did miracles in your name. We did all this kind of stuff. You preached in our streets. We cast out demons in your name. And then he just says, stop, stop. You who love darkness more than light. See, he took care of sin. Sin's not going to send you anywhere. It's who you love that sends you. If you love God, you'll start looking like your future. If you don't love him, you'll keep looking like your past. It's, it's going to be real. There's plenty of people who say they're believers, but then there's something, something happens and they start looking like they're past again. Well, well, those people aren't going to be there. But if we love him and we start looking like our future, well, we, now we, we're connected with our hope, right? All right, keep going. We'll end with this. And the Spirit and the bride say, come. So the Spirit is in, in, impressing on us that the bride desires to have her bridegroom. And so the bride is in our hearts, we're saying, come. Now, imagine this. Why would I say, come to the Lord if I'm living in sin? If I say I'm a believer, but I keep doing darkness, I'm hooked on pornography with my computer. If I'm on, why would I say, come? See, to say by the Holy Spirit, come, is for people who are looking like their future, not people who are bound in their past. And so the bride and the spirit say, come and let him who hears say, come and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. Why don't you stand? Because here's what I pray has happened. That as we spoke about our future and we were able to see the word does it from Old Testament to New Testament that somebody got hungry, somebody got thirsty, that somebody says, I want to know God like that. I want to know the Lord like that. Just like those people that said, I don't know what you got, Pastor Rick, but I got to have it. 
when Jesus called people, he didn't say stay where you were. He said, deny yourself, take up the cross and follow. He said, if anybody wants to follow after me, if they try to keep their life, they will lose it. But if they'll lose their life for my sake, you will have it forever. Look like your future. He said, this way is a narrow way and few there are that find it. A narrow means restrictive. It means, uh, why am I restricted? Because I'm looking like my future. I don't do like the world asks. I do like he says, and it's not easy, but he'll get us there. He'll empower us to live the life, and we can look like our future. So if you're here, and you know right now, God has already impressed on your heart to lay everything down, to let him be Lord, to take yourself off the throne and put him on it, to be able to start denying yourself and accepting that cross, accepting that, that you can't just do anything you want to. And he promises he will empower you by the Holy Spirit to live a life that he just told you about. So if that's you today, uh, I, I can lead you in a prayer. Your brothers and sisters that have already done it will be happy for you. They'll support you in the prayer. You have to be bold in front of men and women and confess Christ. If that's you today, be bold. Raise that hand and we'll say this prayer with you. Anybody in the room that needs that prayer, raise your hand up high and we'll say this prayer with you. Come in your heart your life to the living God. Anybody need that prayer? All right, I don't see any hands. I'm going to trust you've done that. All right, church, you know what we got? Seven days. Seven days. Oh, my dear. After hearing this message, how are you going to waste these next seven days? <laughs> Come on, let's live with the light on. Come on. Don't cover it up. Let somebody see it. Come back with a testimony on your lips about somebody who had to say, I got to have whatever you got. Willing to speak, willing to share when you get your moment. Amen. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for sharing this word. I pray you use it mightily in our brothers and our sisters. And may you reveal yourself all over Del Marva. And may we give you all the honor and glory for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right. Read those announcements. Hug a neck. You're dismissed.